there is no one right way to parent. There are some strategies that are gonna work better or worse for kids with different genetically influenced temperaments with brains that are wired in different ways. For parents to talk about how strongly genetically influenced kids' behavior is, it feels like, well, so you're telling me there's nothing I can do about this? Which is not what you wanna hear when you are the parent with the child throwing the you know massive fit at the grocery store. <laughs> there's no gene for antisocial behavior or genes for depression. We now know there's thousands of genetic variants. They each have a tiny effect on their own. But what we can do is we can add them all up, weight them by their effect size to create a genetic score for individuals. The idea that if we just do everything right, if we just read enough books and do all the things we're supposed to do as parents, that we are going to parent our delightful little children into lovely human beings and go to Ivy League colleges and win Nobel Prizes. And there is nothing from child development that suggests that we have that kind of control over who our kids become as parents. One of the most popular theories around parenting is the four parenting styles. I think that's sort of what people usually tend to um, remember or think about when they are thinking about parenting and some of the stuff that we know about it. How does that theory work with what we know about genetics and how genetics affect behavior? So there's a lot of research behind those four parenting styles. So I'm assuming you're talking about the authoritarian, authoritative, um, yeah. neglectful and permissive. So it's sort of where parents fall on how controlling they are and how warm they are, sort of across those two dimensions and those four quadrants. Um, there's quite a, quite a lot of, ec of research on that. But the thing that it doesn't really take into account is that how a parent perceives their parenting as falling along those dimensions and how children perceive the parent's parenting as falling along those dimensions is genetically influenced. And this is related to the fact that all of our brains are wired differently. And this gets at one of the major things that I talk about in my book, The Child Code, that means that there is no one right way to parent. There are some strategies that are gonna work better or worse for kids with different genetically influenced temperaments with brains that are wired in different ways. But I think one of the most salient examples of this is that I actually had um, my child uh, fill out and I filled out that quadrant for kind of where he saw me and his father falling on those two dimensions. So what quadrant did we fall in and, and kind of where? And he rated the two of us, and then we each rated each other. So, you know, each parent rated the other parent, and then our <laughs> son rated the two of us. And, you know, we had actually, we all squarely put ourselves in the kind of authoritative uh, quadrant, right? Like having some boundaries and control there, but at the same time being higher on warmth, um, which, you know, in psychology would be considered where you kind of want to be falling. The, co the correct yeah. quadrant yeah, to live in. the right <laughs> quadrant, if you will. But what was really interesting is that where on that quadrant we fell was very different. So I thought my husband was far more uh, controlling. He was you know, far higher on the strict and lower on warmth. He thought that I was, you know, way lower. I, I was, you know, bordering on permissive. I didn't have enough boundaries and rules and I was way too high on warmth. And my son actually sort of was somewhere in the middle, interestingly. And so, you know, he didn't think his dad was as controlling as he was. He didn't think that, you know, I was... Um, you know, as as warm or as uh, as you know as low on the control dimension as his dad had thought that I was, and and so I think it really gets at 
the way that we think of as what is the right way to be parenting, you know, it, it oftentimes doesn't take into account how our children are viewing us as parents. And the reality is that their reality is extremely important in our relationship with them and in, you know, how our parenting affects them. Mm -hmm. And I suppose so it's the lens through which they are seeing your parenting can color it differently one way or the other. Absolutely. And so I think this really gets at the whole, there is not just one way to be a good parent. I feel like there's so much pressure right now in our society, um, particularly in the United States. I'm not as familiar with, um, with the UK, but this idea of like, if you just do all the things right, right, we hold ourselves <laughs> to this ideal of how we should be parenting our children and molding them and enriching them. And you're doing all the things we should be doing. But the reality is that children are, you know, they're resilient beings. And the way that they are experiencing our parenting is, you know, often many of the things that we are trying to do that we think is the right thing to do or the best thing to do, you know, it isn't perceived that way by kids. And honestly, sometimes it's not even the best thing for kids. And, you know, we're seeing that interestingly with respect to how our kids have so much less free time now, so, so much so much less unmonitored, un, you know, scripted time. Meaning when I was a child, we were out running around in the woods, you know, playing with our friends and we had to be home by midnight and, or excuse me, by midnight, by dark, we had to be home by dark. Um, and, uh, and so, but other than that, we were running around the neighborhood with the other kids. So when somebody fell out of a tree and, you know, broke their arm, we had to figure out what to do about it. Now, kids are so much less likely to have time when there isn't an adult supervising. And, you know, if they do, they almost always have access to their phone. So somebody falls and hurts themselves, they immediately call a parent who comes in to take care of it. And, you know, there's there's good associated with that. We know that, you know, less unsupervised time has actually related uh, is now related to lower rates of alcohol use and risky sexual behavior and other kinds of things in adolescents. But it's also related to their feeling less, you know, ability to control their own lives and to know how to handle new situations. And we see that a lot on college campuses where mm -hmm. kids are essentially showing up and, um, you know, all of a sudden we've gone from sculpting their days, right? Like taking them to places and these activities and here's what you're going to be doing and helping them with college applications and all the things. And then we say, okay, great. Good luck to you. And now they're on their own and they have to figure out how to eat by themselves and get to classes and do their laundry and schedule their lives. And they just haven't had that same developmental experience and practice that you know we had a generation ago. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it really speaks to how this idea that there isn't necessarily a best way to parent or a right way to parent. And in fact, some of the things that we do that are very well intentioned um, might not always be the best thing for our kids. I think part of the reason as well why parents would like reach out to try and get some advice from experts is because you are winging it essentially. I think we, if you ever brought home a baby from the hospital, you do kind of question like, did they, did they really let me go home with this little thing? No manual, no instructions, no cars, no videos, nothing. And you are kind of then winging it. So then the minute you start thinking about, okay, like, what can I do to, you know, to create the, the most conducive environment for that child, the minute you start thinking about it, you're presented then with 100 different books, each one of them having the parenting style to follow, and they all can't be right. So how then 
like what role do parents really then play in the development of children knowing what we know about how strong the influence of genetics is yes so all of us who have come home with that baby from the hospital and realize <laughs> oh we're responsible for this little person and i don't know what i'm doing here the idea that someone can tell you what to do is extremely comforting right that's what we want to know and there are as you say a ton of books out there that will tell you what to do um the piece that most of those books are not talking about and honestly because my background is in developmental and clinical psychology you know i didn't pay a lot of attention to what was out there in kind of the popular press and mainstream sort of parenting books because I'd taken all these classes and things on it. And uh, so it was really when I became a parent and oh, the irony, I found myself raising the challenging child that I study. And I thought, <laughs> oh, thank goodness. I know the research behind all of this because I understood what was going on and I had a sense of what I could do and and also really what was outside of my control, meaning like, ah, I didn't create this problem. You know, I, I, I know how to take it from here, but I had a, a sense of what was going on. The research was really my saving grace in that way. And that's when I started paying attention to the messages that we get as parents from the world and what is out there in so many of those parenting books and parenting blogs and parenting magazines. I mean, there is no shortage of information about parenting, but the piece that was not in there, which is, as you say, the piece that was central to my research and the area that many of us work on is really the incredibly strong role that genetics plays in children's behavior. And that was kind of largely getting ignored. And I think the reason that it's um, ignored, let's say, is because it feels like, well, what am I supposed to do with that as a parent, <laughs> right? To So we know that most behavior, whether it is, you know, impulsivity or emotionality or all the downstream things of that, how, how much kids throw temper tantrums, how angry they get and run around and break toys, you know, all those kind of things. Most all behavior is genetically influenced and it's about, if you have to make a guess, you know, the kind of rule of thumb is it's probably about 50% heritable. And that means that about 50%, half of the differences you see between all these kids, you know, your kids, your best friend's kids, all the kids that are on the playground in how impulsive, anxious, fearful, emotional they are is due to differences in the DNA sequences they were born with, differences in their genetic codes, which influenced the way their little brains were wired. And then the other half is differences in their environments. And I think that for parents to talk about how strongly genetically influenced kids' behavior is, it feels like, well, so you're telling me there's nothing I can do about this, which is not what you want to hear when you are the parent with the child throwing the, you know, massive fit at the grocery store. <laughs> I know I have been that that parent before. And um, but I actually think that ignoring the role of kids genes on their behavior is a huge mistake for what I, I call kind of two big reasons. The first is that I think it contributes to the parenting myth. And so this is the idea that if we just do everything right, if we just read enough books and do all the things we're supposed to do as parents, that we are going to parent our delightful little children into lovely human beings and go to Ivy League colleges and win Nobel Prizes. And there is nothing from child development that suggests that we have that kind of control over who our kids become as parents. 
um, what it does is it puts a lot of pressure on ourselves. And I think, you know, if we're all honest, it can lead us to be a little bit judgy of other parents too. When you, you know, see the child throwing the massive fit and think, wow, what is that parent, you know, doing or not doing that they can't get that child to behave properly. And this, I think all is attributed to this idea that we have ascribed more responsibility, control, et cetera, to parents than they actually have on their kids' behavior. And the second reason, I think it's a huge mistake not to be talking about the important role of genes on kids' behavior, is it misses the opportunity for what we might think of as, you know, precision parenting or personalized parenting. And what I mean by that is, our kids are all wired differently, right? They all have a unique little genetic code that influence the way their brains are wired. We can look around at all of our friends and you know the people we know in our lives and go, we're all really different. You know, We often talk about it as personality. Some people are more extroverted or introverted. Some people are more impulsive. Some people are more anxious. We know that you know we all kind of differ in the way our brains work and so do our kids. They differ in the way their brains are wired. And that means they are not going to respond the same way to our parenting. And so by not recognizing kind of each of our unique kiddos and how they're wired, we're missing the opportunity to tailor our parenting to what is going to work best for that particular child. Mm. And I think as well, like when you when you start when you're talking about how children are different, and then in terms of like them seeing the world, a parent could try and literally replicate exactly the same parenting style with two different kids, and if those two different kids will fall on a different sort of side of the spectrum when it comes to their personality, which unless they are like identical twins, they are quite likely to be quite different. You're not going to get the same kid as an adult. Like that actually then shapes the way they they see what you do shapes the environment that they live in. And their version, their reality of their environment shapes who they become. So do you want to then tell us about that interplay between the environment and genes? Because I think sometimes we see it as there is an environment on this side and the genes on this side and they shall never meet or intertwine. But there is a bit of the, it, it's a it's a bit of the more <laughs> black, black, white and a lot of gray spectrum in the middle. Absolutely. And so. You know, the running joke in our field is that everyone is an environmentalist until they have their second child. And then they go, whoa, <laughs> wait a second. I'm doing all the same things. I mean, we are literally the same parents, you know, same household trying to do same rules. And this one is turning out so different. Um, and, and that is a perfect example. And usually the big wake up call for parents that it's not all about our parenting. Our kids have their own unique little temperaments and dispositions, and that's going to shape, you know, how they respond to you, how they actually influence the way that you parent them. And that gets at this other really important thing that you were just talking about, which is that our genes and our environments are not separate things that happen to us. And so, you know, we often talk about gene environment correlation and gene environment interaction. And so I'll talk about what those two things are and, and what they mean and how they relate to parenting and to kids. So the first is that, you know, our environment is actually related to our genotype. And here's what that means. So a child that is, for example, a happy baby, an easy baby, if you will, um, they are more likely to be picked up, to be held by lots of people, to be smiled at, to be cooed at. You know, if you are a baby that cries all the time, right? That's just sort of you know, some babies are more colicky, more upset. They are they more fearful. They don't like to be on other people. Nobody wants to hold a crying baby. You know, you don't even want to hold your own crying baby after a while, much less somebody else's. That from the very beginning. So what are they getting? 
less interaction with other adults, less like warmth and, oh, people are friendly and look at all these people I'm interacting with. Well, now all of a sudden imagine those same little toddlers, right? The one that is more of a like sociable, exploring, wanting to meet new people. They're much more likely to go up and say hi to other grownups. And then they engage them and they get positive feedback because they're sweet and they're adorable. Now maybe they're school age. They're at the front of the class. They're helping the teacher. Oh, the teacher is paying attention to them. Maybe they get picked for special things, right? Now they're like on the teacher's radar. Oh, this is a great kid. We're going to put them in better classes. We're going to give them more attention. Their academics get better. You can start to see how you start to have the snowball effect. Now take that other child, maybe the one who's more fearful, more anxious. They're hiding behind their parents' legs, right? Like they, they don't want to be around other people. They, they're like, oh, they don't get as much interaction. They don't develop as much comfort working, you know, with other individuals. Maybe they sit in the back of the class because they're nervous. They don't speak up. The teacher thinks, who's the kid in the back of the class? They're not engaged. They clearly don't care about their academics. Maybe they're just naturally more introverted or they're more anxious or they're, you know, shyer. And, you know, all of a sudden now they're not picked for the special activities. They're not put at the front of the class. So those are examples of ways of how our kids' temperaments can start to shape their environments from very early on. You know, as our kids get older, they have an even greater ability to shape their environments, meaning, you know, our adolescents, are they choosing to hang out at the movies with, you know, one or two close friends? Or are they out there going to parties, you know, where there's alcohol or other kinds of, you know, um, risky behaviors going on? They're selecting into those environments in part based on the way their brains are wired and what they're drawn to. But this also now can get at how parents can have such an important role, because if your child, let's say, is that child who is more anxious and more fearful, um, then what they have are some, it doesn't mean they don't have the ability to interact with the teacher or to interact with other adults. It just means that's not a skill that comes naturally to them. And so as parents, what we can do is if we just try and go like, come on, you know, like, why aren't you, what's wrong with you? Like there, there's nothing, there's people aren't scary. These are our <laughs> friends, you know, we're, we're throwing them into the deep end when they don't naturally have those skills. <laughs> or we might inadvertently be hurting their self-esteem, making them think, what is wrong with me that, you know, like, I, I can't mm -hmm. speak up in class. And I'm not like my sibling who maybe is like always wanting to try out for everything or kind of be the star, or, you know, the this in the spotlight. Like, gosh, why, why can't I do that? We can actually, by recognizing, okay, this is how our child is wired. We can help teach them some of those skills that don't come naturally to them. We don't throw them in the deep end of the pool when they can't swim. We start to slowly build up that confidence, right? We introduce them maybe to one trusted of all adult. They get more comfortable. Now you're bringing them into, you know, more social settings. It's kind of the, it's a marathon, not a race, but we can, and we can also help them see like, the, the unique parts of them as strengths, not as liabilities, right? Meaning, hey, you know what? You're somebody who um, is more introverted and that's okay. You know, your sibling or your best friend or whomever, they're somebody who they like to speak up, right? And that's okay. Being quieter means, you know, you're more likely to listen to other people and you can be a really good friend. But we need to make sure that how are we going to make sure that the teacher knows that you're engaged in the material and you like the material and you're not speaking up because you didn't do the homework, right, or do the reading. And so those are ways that you can essentially, you know, adapt your parenting to your child to help them with the areas that might be challenges and to really accentuate their strengths. Mm. I think as you are talking about it, it's... It, oh, internally I was laughing because my my older brother is more extroverted than I am, and even though we both have quite strong personalities, because he's he's got that extra oomph when it comes to his extroversion, 
<clears throat> our actual temperaments are quite different simply because he's way more out of there. And I remember throughout the entire childhood, like comparing myself to him and it's like, well, he's the superstar. And yes. it was always, like you say, you know, the teachers, because he's such a charmer and he can just roll it off when he needs to. And I just, <laughs> I remember like even thinking to myself, like, oh, why, why can't I be like that, like this? But, you know, I definitely am a bit more of the person that will sort of sit back a little bit and observe. And it kind of takes you really until you start growing up with a little bit of the hindsight to actually see that there are strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses in both of the approaches. But there are some aspects of genetics and environment sort of behaviors that don't necessarily have that silver lining. And I know that you've done um, some extra work when it in, in the area of um, addiction, but mm -hmm. I also wanted to sort of touch on the antisocial behavior because these things will also be influenced by genetics to some degree. I would be really curious to actually like find out from you how, how does it then work genetics and environment for some of these traits, let's say, let's say, or behaviors that don't really have, you know, a lot of that good and bad side is just problematic. Yeah. So I'm so glad you raised that because I think that is one of the, um, the things that people have a fear about, like, oh, but what about genetic influences on conduct problems, you know, or, or being predisposed to ADHD or addiction or those kind of things. And I'm going to, I'm going to reframe the way that, you know, um, that we think about it a little bit here, which is that virtually all behavior is on a bell curve. And so we know, for example, that there is a genetic predisposition um, toward why some people are more at risk for substance use disorders and are also more at risk for ADHD and for, um, for conduct problems and antisocial behavior. And... A lot of people, when I talk about addiction in particular, will say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know it's genetically influenced. But what they are imagining is that there are genes that influence the way bodies respond to drugs that make people more at risk for developing dependence or addiction problems with that drug. And there's a little bit of truth to that. There are some genes that are involved in the metabolism of particular drugs that make some people, you know, like them more, um, more likely to metabolize them in a way that either makes them sick, which is protective, or that makes them really like it, which can be a risk factor. But that's actually just a tiny part of the genetic influences on addiction. What is the much bigger risk pathway is not related to the way bodies respond to drugs, but it's related to the way our brains are wired. And so a big part of what makes some people more at risk for substance use disorders, but also more at risk for ADHD, conduct problems, antisocial behavior, is the way that our brains process risk and reward and consequences. And so we know that some people are more impulsive. They are more risk-taking, right? There are people that are more prone to like either jump on what's right in front of them if it's something they're really excited about, right? Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it is doing something crazy with friends, right? Um, maybe it's, you know, something that you're in a really bad mood and you go smash somebody's car or break a window or, you know, those kind of things. That is all related to impulsivity and how much you are sort of like you react quickly versus your brain goes, ooh, wait a second. Let me think about the consequences here, right? <laughs> and so let's take alcohol for a second. You know, um, we know that the average age of onset of problems is late adolescence and um, early emerging adulthood. Well, prefrontal cortexes, which is the part of your brain that helps you stop and think through consequences and weigh cost benefit, 
is not even fully developed till you're 25. And so what you have are younger people who are already primed toward liking peers, liking new experiences. That's what's going on with their brains. Now you have some people whose brains are particularly wired toward that. They're even more impulsive and risk-taking. And when somebody shows up at their you know, um, dorm room and says, hey, there's a great party tonight. Do you want to go? And they think, amazing. Yes, that sounds like so much fun. Their brain doesn't immediately go, ooh, I've got an exam tomorrow. And if I don't stay home and study, I might not do as well. And then that might affect my grades. And I really want to become a doctor, which means I'm going to need good grades to get into med school. To You know, that is a lot of higher level thinking. That person is right there. And that party is right on the other side of that doorway, right? And so that's a way how brains that are kind of wired toward impulsivity can lead to being more likely to use substances, use in risky ways, and potentially develop problems. And it's that exact same predisposition that puts kids at elevated risk of ADHD and of behavior problems and of what we might call antisocial behavior, right? When somebody like bumps into you or pushes you at a bar or says something you don't like, right? Do you turn around and slug the person? Or do you think like, hmm, if I do that, what are all the bad things that are going to happen? They're going to hit me back. Maybe I get drugged down to jail, you know, like maybe I lose my job, maybe all those things. Well, brains that are more wired toward impulsivity are not naturally thinking through all those things. And it turns out that tendency, that tendency toward more risk-taking, toward more impulsivity, that is distributed normally, just like a bell curve in the population, which means that it is normal for some people to be much higher on that. That's just, you know, kind of the way that the gene pool works. And that's why I would say even that, being a risk taker, is not necessarily a bad thing. It puts you at elevated risk for things like substance problems, antisocial behavior, behavior problems in kids. But we also know that CEOs, entrepreneurs, fighter pilots, you know, emergency room physicians, they tend to be more of those people that are also drawn toward taking risk and that high excitement and high energy. And so that's why I would say it's less about, ooh, you know, is this a bad genetic predisposition? And it's more of a, okay, this is a trait some people carry. It's how their brains are wired. Mm -hmm. Nobody is destined to develop problems. So how do you think about how do we shape that to minimize potential problems, you know, alcohol problems, getting into trouble, et cetera. And how do we instead reframe that as like, how are we going to channel that so that they can take that risk taking into maybe extreme sports, right? Or being really driven in something they care about or want to do, you know, the sort of channeling it into entrepreneurial things or um, I do, in fact, come from a whole family of fighter pilots, right? My my father, my brother, my son's father, you know, are all fighter pilots. Is it any wonder that I ended up with a highly impulsive risk-taking child? No, <laughs> that's just sort of like, you know, one of the byproducts of this disposition toward more risk-taking. Um, so, and so that's why I kind of want to reframe this idea that there are bad genes or bad dispositions, there are genes that influence the way our brains are wired that can lead to problems and, and cause challenges in our lives. Um, but those can also be channeled into other outlets. You know, they're not all bad. Being a risk taker isn't all bad. It means you try new things. You're open to more new experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and the same can be said, by the way, about depression and anxiety too. You know, people will say to me like, ah, you know, is this normal in my child? And I say, well, again, whether you're looking at impulsivity or whether you're looking at, you know, anxiety proneness, it's distributed as a bell curve, which means it's going to be normal for some kids to be very high on that trait. So, you know, the better question is not like, oh, is this normal or is this bad? It's, is this showing up in ways that are interfering with their life? And if so, you know, how do we help teach them strategies to manage that disposition, to reduce that risk and 
channel that into and, and kind of see the positives associated with it. Even mm -hmm. a little bit of anxiety, you know, that makes you study for your tests the next day. That makes you prepare for a job interview, um, you know. Uh, so so there, there can be good and not so good associated with almost all dispositions. I suppose it's difficult to think about everything that way because it is so nuanced. So as I was sort of imagining, okay, well, antisocial personality, what type of traits these people will have. They will have, I don't know, tens, hundreds, whatever amount of genes that will be predisposing them to perhaps risk-taking, lower empathy, um, more impulsivity, you know, these sort of kind of things. But then I was trying to sort of imagine, okay, well, let's think about a positive application of these traits. Well, a neurosurgeon could be one. Like if you are really high on empathy, even if you're a risk taker, even if you're quite impulsive, you are not going to be cutting into flesh of people. Let's let's face it. Like you will not be able to do it. You kind of, you have to have that personality that normally if we just sort of looked at it, we would place it on a little bit of the antisocial quadrant if you like <laughs> and it's it's tricky to think about everything in nuance like that because then the labels that we use to communicate are starting to be a bit less almost like a bit less meaningful like it's it doesn't really convey the information that we are trying to convey, like the labels that we use, they are kind of used for a reason. But I think that with that behavior versus the environment and the genes, it is so complex that, like, how do you even study things like that? <laughs> because you've got layers of complexity and the amount of, like, data points that is just overwhelming. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the things that we look at is, um, so historically we had twin studies as a strategy to essentially try to understand something about how important are genes and environments. And so the basics of the twin design are basically that, you know, twins essentially come in two types, if you will, monozygotic, uh, or what is sometimes called identical twins. So single egg fertilized by single sperm. And at some point during cell division, it breaks into two. So you have two genetically identical individuals. Um, some, some folks may uh, be old enough like me to remember when they cloned Dolly the sheep. And then all of a sudden there was all this talk about, oh, are humans next? Are we gonna be cloning humans? Well, there are clones all over the planet in the form of identical twins or monozygotic twins. They have genetically identical material, yet they grow into different people. They're far more similar than you know two random people uh, that you might select, but for anyone who's known you know, identical twins. And, you know, that's why we don't use the term identical in, in um, science. We call them monozygotic. They came from a single <laughs> egg. Um, and then the other one is fraternal twins or what we would call dizygotic twins. So two eggs fertilized by two sperm. Um, they just, it happens at the same time, meaning they're sharing an intrauterine environment. So it's just like order, ordinary siblings. Um, in terms of they're sharing half of their DNA, but they're also sharing an intrauterine environment. So they are age matched. And of course, they can be either same sex, you know, both girls, both boys or opposite sex. Um, and and so what we essentially the way that we learned that virtually all behavior is genetically influenced is via twin studies. And um, if you, you know, go back a few decades, so my um, first mentor, who was one of the founders of behavior genetics, Irv Gottesman, who's passed away in the last few years, but he, you know, he talked about how, when he was in grad school, talking about the idea that there were genetic influences on personality or behavior, like that was considered ridiculous because everybody knew that behavior was shaped by parents, right? That all of these things were all a result of parenting. If you look back, you know, it's it's really sad if you look at the history of like 
even things that we know are strongly genetically influenced, like autism or schizophrenia, they were considered to be caused by cold mothers. You know, mothers get blamed for everything, right? Like, um, <laughs> and, um, and so it was twin studies where essentially we were able to collect data on, you know, now thousands and thousands of twins, and we would compare how similar our MZ twins who share 100% of their genetic material and when raised together in the same home by the same parents are sharing their home environment, how similar are they compared to fraternal twins who are being raised together in the same environment by the same parents, but are only sharing half of their genetic material. And if genetics is important, we would expect that MZs should be more similar to each other on impulsivity, anxiety, you know, um, health outcomes like alcohol use disorder or schizophrenia or, um, or whatever you're studying, than fraternal twins who, you know, are sharing only half of their genetic material. And that's in fact exactly what was found for virtually every outcome that's been studied now. And, um, you know, if it was all home environment, it would be the characteristics of the parent that would be important, being mm -hmm. raised by a parent who has alcohol problems or depression or schizophrenia. Um, and then it wouldn't matter how much of your DNA you share with your sibling. It, it just matters that you're being raised in a household. So we should see no difference between, you know, monozygotic and dizygotic siblings. But in fact, that's not what we found. We found that MZs are more alike on virtually everything indicating that there's genetic influences. And then you can do all these other neat experimental designs, like there's you know identical twins that were separated at birth, and so you can bring them back together and see how similar they are. Um, you can do adoption studies where you look at how similar are kids to biological parents that you know they weren't raised by, as compared to how similar are they to adoptive parents who you know provide their environment but didn't provide them genes. And so all these kind of natural experimental designs were used to study how important is home environment and how important are genetic influences. And that's really where it became, uh, you know, profoundly obvious that genetic influences are important on all these behaviors that we thought were all environmental or all caused by, you know, mm -hmm. how you were parenting. So. Okay. So I'll pause uh, there. <laughs> when you are talking about then, so we now know the design of the studies that actually lets you sort of parcel off the the strength of the prediction power, let's call it, for things like intelligence, which is, I believe that's one of the most heritable traits. How, how much um, sort of heritability is carried with things like addiction, for example, to substances, or I'm not even sure whether I can call it antisocial behavior or whether it's split into things like impulsivity and low empathy and risk taking. Is it split or do you actually, or are you able to cluster these things together to really see what which kids could be potentially at, um, you know, a risk of developing some sort of problems in the future if they are not um, nurtured appropriately? So there have been studies of all of those things. And when it comes to meaning risk taking, impulsivity, different facets of impulsivity, right? So meaning are you somebody who does crazy things when you're in a good mood or who does crazy things when you're in a bad mood? Or are you somebody who has, you know, trouble sticking with a task if it's boring? Or are you somebody who is more, um, you know, all these different kinds of dimensions you can imagine of impulsivity as well. And, and then you're even talking about, are you someone who's engaging in antisocial behavior? So, you're getting in bar fights, you're writing bad checks. Um, you know, if you're a kid, you're, you know, breaking and entering, you're vandalizing property, you're staying out past when your parents tell you to be home, all those kind of things. As a pair, as compared to something like callous, unemotional, right? That gets at that, like, I'm somebody who engages in cruelty or who doesn't seem to care about the feelings of others, you know, who has low empathy. Um, there's actually less research around that 
cal that callous, unemotional piece appears to be different and somewhat separate than all of those other parts of impulsivity and mm -hmm. antisocial behavior and conduct problems. Those all appear to be more heritable and to hang together. And it also, um, they're, so they're heritable at around 50%. And it, it looks like the genes that influence that are largely overlapping with the genes that influence risk for addiction, right? It's all related to this kind of risk-taking impulsivity. And um, substance use problems are also heritable at about 50 to 60%. Things like depression or anxiety are somewhat more environmentally influenced. So they're heritable at about 30%. And um, some of the more severe mental illnesses, so like bipolar disorder, um, sometimes called manic depression or schizophrenia or autism, those all tend to be more heritable at around 80%. Um, but a key thing is that the environment can also change the likelihood that you will display that behavior even if you are carrying a risky genetic disposition. Mm -hmm. And so I talked about how twin and adoption studies were kind of used to originally figure out how important genes are, how important the environment is, but you could also study under certain environmental conditions, are genes more important or less important? And so, for example, we find that genetic predispositions um, toward substance use are more important in under conditions where there is low parental monitoring. And so, for example, you know, so that's basically saying for kids that are carrying risky genetic dispositions and their parents aren't checking in on who are you with, where are you going, what are you doing, you know, those kinds of providing more boundaries and rules they're more likely to be getting into trouble and, you know, have more conduct problems, um, have more risky substance use. So that's a way that like we can also study how the environment can change the importance of our genetic predispositions or the mm -hmm. likelihood that somebody with a risky genetic predisposition will ever develop problems. And now we're actually at a point where we can scan the entire genome, identify the thousands of locations that are altering risk because there is no gene for alcohol problems. There's no gene for antisocial behavior or genes for depression. We now know there's thousands of genetic variants. They each have a tiny effect on their own. But what we can do is we can add them all up, weight them by their effect size to create a genetic score for individuals. So it's essentially like how many of those genetic risk factors you're carrying for a particular outcome. And then we can start to study, okay, kids who are carrying different levels of actually measured genetic risk, what kinds of environments are exacerbating, make it more likely that they're gonna show problems? So those could be things like challenging environmental circumstances, right? The, the social determinants of health that we talk about, less opportunity, mm -hmm. unstable housing, right? Less job opportunity. Those are all things that we know for individuals who are, for example, more at risk of substance problems, antisocial behavior can make it more likely they're gonna have problems. On the other side, we know things like, you know, um, there are things that can reduce risk. Warm, loving parents, right? Parental monitoring when you have, you know, teenagers. Um, having other enriching activities in your life that are enjoyable and rewarding, um, whether it's spousal relationships, good, close friendships, you know, peer groups where there's not a lot of antisocial <laughs> behavior or, you know, other um, substance use going on. All those things can actually reduce the likelihood that someone will display problems. So our outcomes are always a product of our own unique genetic dispositions and our environments. So in terms of the sort of tools that parents could use to actually look at the kids that they've got and try and sort of potentially um, reduce the risk of the things th that their kid might be predisposed with. You obviously mentioned mapping the entire genome. 
like I'm assuming that that would be like the gold standard way of doing things. But what are sort of other other tools of parents sort of trying to um like build a puzzle of where their kid might sit and if they do notice for example certain themes running in families what is it that they can then realistically do to sort of try and just tilt the kid into a bit more productive use of those tendencies and traits Absolutely. So it can feel overwhelming to be like, ah, so now I have to figure out my child's genotype and what environments I'm supposed to be providing to nurture them into the best version of themselves and reduce their risk. And honestly, that's why I wrote my book is to try and help get that research to parents in a really user friendly, easy, digestible way. And so in the child code, I, I joke that, you know, the first part of the book is about the things we've been talking about, the science behind how we know um, that kids' behavior is genetically influenced. And if you're just willing to take my word for it and say like, yeah, yeah, I get it. These kids are all wired differently. You know, you can, you can jump right into the, the middle of the book then has surveys for parents to fill out about their kids. And it's for the three big genetically influenced temperamental dimensions that have a big impact on kids' lives and that have shown up in studies that have been done around the world. I call them the three E's in the book. It's essentially where kids fall on the dimensions of extroversion. So how much do they naturally like being around other people versus, you know, or maybe somewhere in the middle or more introverted. Um, emotionality. How quick are kids to get, you know, some kids are, are just much quicker to get really upset. You know, we sometimes talk about these are the kids that have big feelings or that all of a sudden gets uh, upset, quote unquote, over nothing or out <laughs> of nowhere. Um, that can be one of the hardest things for parents to manage. And, you know, it can be related to anxiety, sensitivity and those sorts of things. And there are certain strategies that work better for kids who are higher on that high emotionality dimension. And then the last one is what we call effortful control or what you know we colloquially call impulsivity, right? Some kids, we know that all kids get better on, at self-regulation as they get older and their brains develop. You know, the parts of the brains that develop first that are about fully developed by adolescence are the parts that respond to reward, you know? And that's why adolescents do so much like risk-taking behavior and generally like to be around other peers and trying new things or things they used to do before feel so boring to them, you know, because their brains are sort of craving that. And there's evolutionary reasons why that would be the case. Um, you know, usually that was the period of time when they had to be leaving their family units to go out and find a mate and, you know, procreate so that the human <laughs> human species would continue because people didn't live that long hundreds of thousands of years ago when our brains were, you know, evolving. That said, so so the part of our brain that's like, oh, let's stop and, you know, be a little more cautious, that that's not even fully developed for anybody until about the mid 20s. But we also know that there's a lot of variability in kids in terms of, you know, where they start and where they finish in terms of just how, how impulsive they are, how risk-taking they are. And so there are certainly strategies that you can work with kids to help them, you know, learn to manage those risk-taking dispositions. And, and so really the middle of the book is kind of, here are some surveys so you can figure out where you, your kiddo falls on those dimensions and where you fall on those dimensions. Because of course, our relationships with our kids are not just about their genetic dispositions, but we all have our genetic dispositions too. And so that influences, you know, how we view their behavior, how we respond to their behavior. Um, it can influence, does it feel like a, a natural, easy fit? Do you get where this behavior is coming from? Because you're like, oh yeah, I was definitely like that as a child. So <laughs> I understand them. Or are you like, Oh, I have no idea where this came from, right? Um, and so, so there's also questionnaires for you to figure out your dispositions. And then the last, you know, sort of whole chunk of the book is all about 
what kind of parenting strategies work better for kids with different dispositional styles, with kids who are higher or lower on each of these three dimensions, and thinking about how you as a parent and your, you know, kind of natural styles um, might be either, you know, creating more challenges or might essentially, you know, help you help your child. And, and so the book is really intended to be how do you take the science and make it really digestible, user friendly? It's me as a parent writing for other parents, not me as a scientist, you know, uh, <laughs> writing in a very scientific way. But it's my effort to try and take the research that I found so helpful in raising my own children to bring that to other parents so that they can benefit from that, too. So let's actually sort of try and parcel it off because I love the sort of how you then um, mentioned that it's not just about the kid. It's about the alchemy that you've got between the kid and your personality, because when those personalities are, are on the opposite ends, you can see it as, oh, my God, what the heck is this? But at the same time, you might actually have stronger predisposition to sort of if you've got a kid that is really high on emotions, for example, is very emotional. And if you are really like a stable rock, like you can actually provide them with a bit of balance. But then if you've got, for example, parents that are way on the extroverted sort of, um, for example, scale, and then they've got a kid that is really extroverted, like how do just give us maybe an idea of one of one or two of these sort of matches or mismatches and how they can interplay together. Absolutely. So let's take extroversion first because it's an easy one. So you can imagine that if you have an extroverted parent and an extroverted child that is, or an introverted parent and an introverted child, then as parents, we are usually, especially when our kids are young, planning activities for our kids that we think would be fun with them, right? So the extroverted parent with an extroverted child, they're taking them to sporting events and to the playground and big play dates, and they're having fun. They're with all their friends. Child is having fun. They're with all their friends. That's when parenting feels, quote, easy. Now, you know, or maybe you're a more introverted parent, and so you're like, oh, I would, you know, like to take my child to the reading hour at the library. How fun does that sound? And you have a child who sits on your lap and listens to them read the book. And it's wonderful. Everybody's having a great time. Now take that same parent, the extroverted parent, with the more introverted child. And this was the combination that I had, right? So on Saturday mornings, I would be like, hey, guess what? This morning, we're going to go to the park and we're going to play, meet up with so-and-so and so-and-so. And you remember, they've got these kids and these kids and that kids. And it's going to be so much fun. And next thing I knew, he would like sweep his, you know, cereal bowl off the table and be like, I'm not going, you know. And, <laughs> and then as a parent, your natural inclination is re to respond to what you might call the bad behavior, you know. What you can't don't throw your dishes on the ground. What do you mean you're not going? Of course you're going. I've already made the plans. We're going. I'm not going. You know, then he would take off his shoes and throw them against the wall. And, you know, you don't have to have a Ph.D. to figure this is going nowhere good quickly. Right. And of course, what I eventually realized is, oh, I'm so extroverted that what I was planning for my son was what sounded like fun to me. But his little brain, who he is much more introverted, you know, he didn't have the language or the words. His little brain couldn't say like, oh, mom, the idea of being at a new place that I'm not familiar with, with a bunch of people I don't know, that sounds really scary to me. You know, instead, he just sweeps the cereal bowl off the table and the shoe gets thrown and, you know. <laughs> And, and eventually what I, when I realized that, I went, oh, okay. So what we did is we did a play date with a friend, right? And so then he gets comfortable with that. Now maybe we're at the same place that he's familiar with, and now there's another friend that gets added in, right? Or maybe it's that friend that's comfortable, but now we're at, we try a new place. And eventually what you do is 
you're teaching your child the lagging skills, the skills that don't come naturally to them, because I was doing the equivalent of throwing a child who couldn't swim into the deep end of the pool because swimming seemed like so much fun to me. How could it not be natural, right? And so that's an example of how when you have a mismatch, um, also, you know, I, I am an academic. I do happen to love the library reading hour. I would took, take him there. He would run around, be pulling all the books. He's also very <laughs> impulsive, right? So he is low on uh, self-control. And so he'd be pulling all the books off. He'd be bouncing out of my seat. You know, you're getting dirty looks from the librarian and the other parents and like, nobody's having fun there, right? Now I'm constantly <laughs> disciplining him, like sit down, you know, you're getting in trouble, blah, blah. I'm embarrassed, he's not having fun. Again, it was a mismatch of, you know, trying to put him in an environment that was not a great fit. It doesn't mean that you have to like totally dick, let your child's temperament dictate all the things you're doing, but it means if we're going into library reading hour, we need to have had some preparation, right? About like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sit quietly. We'll stay for just a little bit. Then we're gonna hit the playground where you can run all around and climb all over and, you know. And so those are ways of how, depending on, you know, your child's temperament and where you naturally fall, it can be an easy fit or it might be a mismatch. There's other places where sometimes you might be a match but it can still create challenges. So emotionality is another one. I had the highly emotional child, right? He would get so upset over things. I also was like that as a child. So I recognized it. You know, I, I came home once and a babysitter was like, I don't know what happened. He was coloring and we were having such a nice time. And then he crumpled up his old picture and threw it on the ground and stormed out and slammed the door. You know, and I went, oh, I know what happened. He, he was probably coloring the sky and the blue wasn't just the right color. So the <laughs> whole thing was ruined because I used to do that as a child. That said, because when you have a highly emotional child and a parent who, you know, I don't crumple things up and throw big fits anymore, but sometimes that child can push my buttons and my natural inclination is to respond quickly and to get emotional too. So, you know, it really requires essentially me using my skills, right? And helping him learn his skills. But that's a place where essentially when you have kids and parents that might be matched, you can push each other's buttons, right? And so it can really require a lot of effort and, and paying attention to how you are as a parent and then how you can help your child learn those kind of skills. So those are a couple examples of how, you know, it's helpful to both think about your child's temperament, but also to think about your own and what the interaction is between, you know, each parent and that child. Okay. So, I mean, your book, I found it really fascinating because I've got a kid that is high on um, emotionality, high on um extroversion i'm on the opposite side of the spectrum to those um we are closer on risk taking i'm i'm high risk taker he's sort of in the middle um but what i found really helpful was sort of putting it all together and even though i had some tools to deal with him in terms of like just managing his energy just when i want to like sit down and read a book there is just no chance that i can do that when he's awake <laughs> um zero chance unless he's running around being feral little kid outside and i can just sit down for five minutes yeah um so but what i found really helpful is sort of putting it all together and certain things that were less obvious less visible um like i started thinking about it so for the people that are thinking about like trying to parent their kid, like your book is really, really cool. And it's more of the manual instead of like a scientific book. There is things that you can do and actually get in terms of the tools. Just before we finish, like where is the edge of the research when it comes to like behavioral genetics? what sort of new advances are happening in the field? You know, what can we expect from that field going onwards? 
Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. So, you know, before you were saying, okay, so do we have to scan the genomes of our kids? And I said, no, you know, you can fill out questionnaires and and get a sense of your kid's temperamental style. Um, and, and for little kids, I still, you know, younger children, I, I think that's still going to be the, the most important kind of, you know, way that we can think about our kids and how they're wired. But you can imagine another advance of genetics is that because we're all born with certain dispositions, knowing something about what kind of risk factors you carry or what sort of, you know, your liability to something like, you know, substance use problems or addiction might be, could actually be very useful potentially in hopefully avoiding problems before they start. And so, um, and one of the things that drives me crazy as a scientist is that we spend so much time talking to other scientists. And what do we do? We write up our research findings and we put them in research journals that are read by other researchers and scientists. And, you know, we don't spend nearly as much time thinking about how do we get research advances to the people who can use them. And I have become very passionate about that over the, you know, um, last decade plus of my life. It's what led me to write the book. But the latest thing that we actually just launched last week is we have made tremendous advances in identifying the spe specific genetic variants that put people more at risk for problems with addiction. And, um, and so those are actually, those risk scores can account for about 10% of the variance in outcomes now, which is you know an effect size that rivals many of the environments that we think of as we need to be, pay attention to this and because we know that these individuals might be more at risk of certain challenges, things like trauma or otherwise. So we've learned a lot about the genetics. We can now create these genetic scores and they are not, you know, they are still just, they take, can tell you if you're at elevated risk or reduced risk, they're not determinative, right? But I think it can be a very useful piece of information to know. We've also learned a ton about what are the early behaviors and environments that put people at elevated risk. And, and we do that by th following thousands of individuals and we've identified, you know, what are the things that were the early predictors of who was most likely to develop problems. And so what we've actually done is put together all that information to create addiction risk profiles. And they are intended for individuals who are, you know, um, young adults or maybe late teenagers to do with their parents and have use as a conversation starter surrounding substance use. Um, but it's at addictionrisk.com. It is the first um, comprehensive, we call it the CARES system, the Comprehensive Addiction Risk Evaluation System. And we're making it available to people um, at essentially the cost that my research center has to create the risk scores. You can go online, you fill out a short survey, and it's about behaviors and environments. It's the things that we know are predictive of developing problems. And then we send a saliva skit kit. You can spit in a tube, you send it back off. We scan the genome, we add up all those locations. Um, we create a genetic you know, score for each individual. And then we put that together to sort of say, people with your profile, you know, your combination of genetic, behavioral and environmental risk, let's say on average, three out of 10 people develop a problem with substance use or kind of related behavioral health challenges. But with this profile, seven out of 10 do, right? And here are some things you can do to reduce your risk or reduce the likelihood of developing problems. And then we break it out into what's your genetic risk um, and what's what are your behavioral and environmental factors that are putting you at risk. And really what we're hoping is that this information will be empowering. So for the first time, we're making, you know, new genetic advances and advances in kind of the epidemiology, the behaviors and the environmental factors. We're, we're trying to bring it to people and making that available to them so they can understand more about their own risk profiles to hopefully make the best choices for their, you know, health and happiness. 
it's so fascinating because it's all then moving into the prevention instead of the cure, which we all know that is way more um, way more efficient. It actually works. So um, fascinating stuff. Where else can people find you and follow your work? So I try to make all kinds of information about the latest advances in science accessible, understandable, and available to the public through my website, which is danielledick.com. You can find me on social media platforms at Dr. Danielle Dick. And the uh, center that I run, I actually run the largest addiction research center in the world. Um, it's at Rutgers, and um, we make a whole variety of pieces of information available. Um, it is addiction.rutgers.edu. And those addiction risk scores that I mentioned are at addictionrisk.com. So if folks are interested in that, they can check that out there too. Thank you so much for your time. This has been fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Danielle Dick. Thanks so much, Kat. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for tuning in to Wisdom Rebellion. Before you go, if you enjoy the conversation, please consider subscribing. It massively helps with keeping the show on the road so we can all build a wiser world together. And if you loved this video, you will also love this one. I'll see you there.